Αγαπητοί συναγωνιστές. Dear comrades, friends and guests, we have reached the end of an extremely interesting international meeting on the subject of the debt, national currencies and democracy. Speaking on behalf of my comrades, and I think that we all share this sentiment, it is safe to say that this meeting has helped us understand two basic things. First, we are not alone in this fight. Neither is the Greek people. We are confronted with a common enemy that must be defeated first by each nation in its own country before it can be defeated internationally. Secondly, in the course of our working meetings in this international gathering, we discovered that we share common beginnings and common goals, such as facilitate building stronger ties for common action. We are already building relationships of camaraderie and solidarity that should also inform relationships between our nations. Before I proceed in expressing some thoughts on the issues that were raised during our meeting, I must first thank from the bottom of my heart the organizing team for the exceptional job they did in making this international meeting possible. And I must point out that the level of professionalism they all demonstrated in carrying through this difficult task puts bigger parties and political organizations with millions in their coffers to shame. The success of this international meeting is due first of all to the comrades Thanasis Laskaratos and the rest of the international relations team. Mara Levidi and Kalypsos Panopoulou who went all out. Georgia Basta and the press office of EPAM. Vasilis Kapadais and the security team which demonstrated how well organized EPAM is against provocations and other overtures from the system. Krisa Varthoulomeu who was in charge of the finance committee. Elena Giuse and the headphone team, those individuals who helped with translation, transportation and accompanied our international guests, and of course the entire organizing team, several dozens of comrades. Forgive me for not mentioning everyone by name, but you know that in EPAM at least, everyone is equal. Comrades, my apologies for what I'm about to say, but it comes from the heart. It is a great honor for me to be accepted by you as your comrade in this our common struggle. I have the acceptance of comrades with very different trajectories from mine or others with whom till recently or before the crisis and the creation of a PAM there was mutual hostility on political or ideological grounds. You are and you have shown yourselves to be the best, the best. This is why I have been and will always be optimistic about the outcome of our fight. There is no way they can beat us. Now, let's get to the point. There is much discussion about what we are. We are aware of it. We live it daily. People ask, some with sincere interest, others ironically or slyly, what are we in the final analysis? Right-wingers, centrists, leftists. Yes, we are people, that's for sure. Although I'm not so sure about the ruling elites. I believe that those who govern this land, and not only this land, as we heard, but almost all the countries on this planet, there are some weird cancerous mutation of the human species which must wipe out from the planet, or they will wipe out the planet. We are, however, first and foremost, and this is the difference between humans and other animals in the planet, settled in homelands. Humans are not nomads. That's what distinguishes them from fish and seaweeds and mammals. This is the big difference, that they settled somewhere and write their history, the history of their fathers, their ancestors, the history of entire peoples who struggle for their freedom, each in their own way. 
and it is the special ways of fighting for freedom that create the great diversity of humankind. Without it, there can be no evolution or advancement. So, we are patriots, not nationalists, patriots. We are patriots because we recognize that without the homeland, there can be no social or political victory to benefit the great majority of the people. Some say, and we are aware of that because we face it daily, especially when we reach out to the left, that this is a class struggle. I, for one, do not disagree, except that the class war by capital, by the markets and their political personnel aims to demolish established states that the citizens can use to defend themselves and gain their political and social enfranchisement. Therefore, their class war has nothing to do with whatever national vindications or patriotic duties we may be talking about. On the contrary, the class struggle of the workers, the working people, the greatest majority of the popular strata that live from the labor, is first and foremost about claiming their country for themselves. It is in this sense that the working people themselves must win the right to be the master and boss in their own country. This is the supreme class vindication of our times in front of a globalized dictatorship of capital and markets. Why? Because for us, the struggle for national liberation and social emancipation go together, hand in hand. There is no difference. There can be no difference. And it was never different in the history of social struggles and popular vindications. Those who separate the class question from the national question, especially today, make the first decisive move towards taking the side of capital, the money markets and their political avatars. They take the first decisive step towards capitulating to the totalitarianism of the markets, as expressed today through supranational authoritarian formations like the Euro and the European Union. Secondly, what is the Euro and the European Union? It's an old story. Not to go as far back in time as our discussion took us, I will only say that in the modern era, especially when people started reclaiming their countries from authoritarianism, Europeanism, was always the response of the darkest reaction against people's democratic demands. Europeanism as an ideology was not the product of a popular or class-based social movement. It was produced by the darkest forces of reaction, whether monarchical, aristocratic reaction, or later fascist, Nazi reaction. It is fundamentally a racist ideology. It discriminates against people on the basis of the continental interests of great concentrations of capital and power and aims to subjugate them. The first to mobilize a unified Europe in practice were the Nazis. It was not a coincidence. They substituted the nation by the race. And what appeared early on as a fascist version of nationalism very soon revealed itself to be a totalitarian globalism modeled on the old empires seeking to remake the world violently into a new order. They were to dictate the terms, both when talking of the new order and of a unified Europe. Let me remind you that when the Nazis' European vision started to emerge shortly before World War II, there were tendencies within the social movements of the time, those on our side, if you wish, tendencies, which till then were oblivious to the notion of fighting for self-determination or national sovereignty and people power in my country, and which easily went over to the Nazi side. There were two such tendencies at the time. The first was expressed officially within the Second International, that is, the Second Socialist Workers International, and it was the tendency of the 
anti-patriots like Gustave Hervé. In 1907, Hervé broke with both the revolutionary and the reformist wings of that period because, well, who needs patriotism? He joined National Socialism during World War II and became a Nazi. There were more such phenomena. The other tendency was the famous moral socialism. We don't need revolts, troubles, insurrections. These are bad things. A moral socialism. For a moral world created morally. And of course, they always believed, the believers, in world revolution. We are not concerned with nations. We should start a world revolution. And so, at the end of 1941, in occupied Belgium, the head of the Belgian Workers' Party, summoned by the name of Henri Derman, having already dissolved the party, organized the pan-European gathering of world revolution enthusiasts, which concluded characteristically the following. The shaping of a united Europe that is taking place under the Nazi occupiers is a progressive development. Although enforced in a barbaric manner, it is a progressive development nevertheless. Frontiers are abolished. The peoples are united in brotherhood. It's not important that some are being executed for fighting for freedom, or, if you wish, for fighting to liberate their country. Oh no, that's not a class issue at all. So, they came up with the following simple answer. Since the Nazi conquest achieved something which could not have been achieved otherwise, even if it was done in a very barbaric way, we should wait until the work of the Nazis is complete in the united euro that the Nazi new order will have created, we will build our own total socialist class revolution. Thank you very much, gentlemen. The difference is that the people at the time had an answer for these individuals. Half of them were executed as Nazi agents, and the other half were never heard from again. Nobody knows them except for people like me, clerk types, who pour into the details and footnotes of history. Back then, though, the people had experience with democratic social movements in which such things were unthinkable and thus marginal. Unfortunately, today they are dominant in large parts of the left which have lost all credibility and in any case were not capable of mobilizing the popular masses. Nowadays there are two clever positions on the subject of a united Europe. Devious. Let's call them clever. Against people changing their thinking there is the terrorism of the media. The whole dark propaganda machine that tells you, if you leave the Euro, the sky will fall, extraterrestrials will land in Ammonia Square, the Nephilims will come and turn you into Elohims, the Heptanese will turn into the Chinese and the Dodecanese into the Octanese, because the rest of the islands will sink. As our previous Prime Minister told us, our banker Prime Minister, Mr. Papadimos, you all remember the rant, that hysterical speech he gave in Parliament, where he said that we won't have milk for our children if we leave the Euro. Apparently our goats will stop making milk. There is no other explanation. It seems that sheep will get suicidal tendencies. Upon hearing about a national currency, they will all get hysterical. Cows will suffer strokes, so there will be no milk and many more such arguments. As the circumstances change and the overwhelming majority of the Greek people has either taken it for granted that we need to go back to a national currency or is starting to reconsider after all these blows, some crafty types are showing up and say things like, yes, you are right, a national currency will get us out of the dead end, but shouldn't we prepare first, that is, shouldn't we see some growth first and then go to a national currency? We hear that, don't we? Golden Dawn, that patriotic organization of mafiosi and Nazis said so. In Parliament even. Yes, for sure, a national currency because we are patriots too, but first, growth.
Do you know what they are really saying? Someone is chained to the ground and is being raped systematically. And one day he is told, your problem is not your change. You need to fly first before you break your chains. This is pure insanity. The second position is a variant of the first. We should negotiate first and then go to a national currency. In other words, to give them every chance to adopt countermeasures against us, to beat the living daylights out of us, to sink the entire country, and then, very casually and totally destroyed, we go to a national currency. This makes no sense. Greece cannot even survive a week of negotiations. There are 1,800 new unemployed every day. There is zero liquidity, not to mention family poverty, immiseration, etc. We know all that. We live it daily. What are we going to negotiate exactly? Our death? And I should mention something here. Economics say that currency changes are done first and are announced after the fact. Why is that? To avoid the worst consequences, the savage speculation that could accompany a currency change and, of course, the countermeasures that will be taken against you. You must be crazy to announce that you are leaving. What you are going to get then is invitations to negotiate. Recently, in the context of discussions we were having with other political organizations, some Syriza ranking members told me that when Alexis Tsipras met with his German counterpart of the Green Party, the man was speaking in the name of Germany. They are state parties, after all. Wasn't the notion of party a start born in Germany anyway? The German Greens leader told Tsipras, you wish to negotiate? By all means. I'm not speaking to you as a Green, but as a representative of the German government. Let's talk. But we'll renegotiate everything from square one, and during the process you will not take any measures in Greece that will affect the commitments your country has made till now. On these preconditions, we can negotiate all you want. So, you see, this is the reality, and it makes perfect sense. If I were in his place, if I were the German Greens leader, I would say the same things. But under such circumstances, who will blink first, you think? Under conditions of economic freefall, total disintegration, the euro is your first move. And you do it the night before, a day before, the closest possible to a great political transformation that will have been undertaken by the great majority of the Greek people. You prepare the monetary switchover with the precision of a military operation because it must be carried out in such a way as to forestall possible reprisals or other events. And this plan will be possible to conceive and implement during a political process driven by the majority of the people. A few weeks ago, in early November, and I mentioned that as a cautionary example, there was a conference here in Athens that was funded by the Ford Foundation, a very familiar institution to us Greeks, since it has been in our face since the Civil War, and the Levy Institute at Bard College in New York, whose board of trustees, totally by coincidence, includes Mr. Soros' American wife. Mr. Levy is a known financier in his own rights, and totally coincidentally, these people came to Athens to sell us on an idea. Since you have a problem with the euro, they said, which is hard currency and drains all liquidity, why don't you adopt a parallel currency? You have both the euro and a supplementary currency. What they were really proposing was a repeat of what happened to the Greek economy under the French gold franc in the Latin currency union of the 1870s and 1880s which led to the third official bankruptcy of the Greek state in 1893, or a repeat of the interwar years when the British sterling was imposed on Greece leading to the fourth bankruptcy of the Greek state, officially in 1932. It looks like this one will be our fifth 
And if the solution, the answer, is not given by the people, this will be our final. There will be no escape from this one. And let's not forget what happened to the Greek economy and society during the German occupation, when the German forces were printing the German war mark and the drachma with an exchange rate of their choosing. This way they could rob the entire country blind and lead it to famine. This is well known. Now, the rejection of the euro is the first move. At the same time, we need to make another move on the debt. What to do about the debt? To begin with, we need to understand that the problem of the debt is not a public finance issue. Unfortunately, neoliberalism has shaped our thinking, which is the real problem. They say it is a public finance issue. What is the debt? I have a negative balance of payments or a government deficit, so I borrow to cover the deficits. That's not it. Those who look at the public debt from a narrow public finance perspective miss the real point. The public debt reflects power relations, as it always has, relations of domination, exploitation and subjugation. It is not simply a fiscal measure. If we analyze government borrowing and the public debt from this perspective, we discover some very interesting dimensions. First of all, the public debt is one of the historically fundamental instruments for ensuring that the state, any state, from the strongest to the weakest, passes in the hands of a particular class, the aristocracy of money, as the classic economists would say. This most parasitic of all classes that profits through debt claims of no real value from the daily toil of an entire nation can buy off the whole state apparatus. The modern political, economic and banking systems were created on the basis of public debt. If there were no public debt, there would be no central bank, there would be no tax system as we know it today, there would be no political parties bought or sold off trying to manage their succession in power by turning the state into a party fiefdom to distribute to their clients. All these historical phenomena, which I don't have time to analyze right now, are the product of public debt. Secondly, the public debt is a form of illusory, entirely fictitious, virtual capital that consists of debt claims against the state and through the state against the entire society. This is the parasitic element I mentioned earlier. Thirdly, profiteering on government securities, bonds, notes, etc., and the public debt constitute one of the basic functions of what economists call generalized devaluation of capital and primarily production. And first and foremost, of fictitious capital in crisis conditions. It is also one of the main outlets of outlets for hugely overaccumulated capital, which is what we are witnessing on a global scale. The more finance capital accumulates in the hands of the few, as it is today, the less it can be invested in production and yield profits in the traditional way, that is, by exploiting the labor power of the workers and creating business profit. The capital that cannot be invested there must necessarily either vanish, become totally devalued or become interest-bearing. For it to become interest-bearing it must seek borrowers. So when 50 banks, and this is confirmed by studies, 50 banks worldwide controlled $1,200 trillion, that is, about 20 to 25 times the equivalent of the global domestic product, the global GDP, all this capital will have to find outlets not in production, which is not enough, but in lending. Households, businesses and states will have assumed debt burdens directly or indirectly through debt securities. In other words, through banks whose inordinate size makes them supermarkets of credit instruments. Banks no longer serve the traditional function of banks, which was 
intermediation. They are, as American economists say, a credit industry. Well, we don't want a credit industry. We want real industries, people at work, actual production, and banks that support the growth of industry and production in general. Fourthly, public debt not only feeds the whole system of speculation that maintains and reproduces money markets under capitalism, but the international credit system as well. Lending to private individuals and governments was the first form of capital export known to the world. It is not an accident that this form of capital export began to grow after 1815, that is, when Britain had accumulated huge amounts of capital due to her continental dominance and was looking for ways to expand her hegemony or open new markets, not through mean military means, which increased her debts, but through other means. The other means was the City of London, a banking center which concentrated over-accumulated capital. This is the origin of the so-called capital exports. One of the first victims of this capital export was modern Greece. In 1823 and 1824, two large loans were made to Greece under colonialist terms. British financiers, being smart, doubted that Greeks would actually gain independence. So they made the Greek envoys sign the debt obligation not in the name of the Greek state, but the Greek nation, or rather, since the concept of nation was not current at that time, in the name of the Greek race, whether under the Ottoman yoke or independent as a race you owe to the British. Therefore, extricating the society and the economy from the debt is or should be one of the most fundamental political objectives, and I stress political objectives of a people. Besides, when money was born as a means of value exchange and as a means of wealth accumulation, so was interest. Since then, humanity has been struggling against debt, over-indebtedness and the subjugation of man, precisely through interest rates and borrowing, of course, to the lender or the money owner. Since the time of the Hammurabi Code, in 2520 BC, humanity has been fighting to rid itself of these chains. The societies who succeeded in doing that created the preconditions for growth, not in the general sense, but in the sense of civilizational growth. They were able to create exceptional civilizations based on anthropocentric philosophies and on democracy. The first one, and this is not by accident, was the ancient Athenian democracy. It began with Solon Sisachthia, Solon Esie Toachthos, that is, he removed the plebeian population's huge loads of debt, which were forcing them to sell their bodies and their families to slavery to repay debts. The classic ancient democracy was built on the basis of Sisachthia, and it was precisely the debt that accumulated in later centuries that brought down the ancient Athenian democracy. The same thing happened in ancient Rome, etc. So, what can one do realistically? Realistically speaking, history is strewn with the ruins of plans and proposals to write off or reduce debts relying on the good will of the lenders. Today we hear the calls, let's negotiate with the lenders, we should convince them, etc. I promise you, there will be no result. They argue that there are no examples of countries that cancelled their debts unilaterally. Well. We could mention a number of examples, including Greece in 1939 cancelling its debt to Belgium. But I will pose the question differently. Is there a country that cancelled its debt or parts of it with the agreement of its creditors and her citizens prospered? There is none since the 19th century. A debt write-off must be a political act of a sovereign nation, so that it works to its benefit, so that there are no consequences and trade-offs to its detriment. Lenders will always engineer those who keep countries and peoples under their control or exploit them. Only the people's tenacious struggle 
has produced the few practical examples of debt cancellation without concessions to the lenders that were destructive to nations and countries. We need to have a unilateral debt cancellation fought for by the people. There is no other choice for us. The basic legal and political tool for doing this is to reclaim our national and popular sovereignty. Only then can we bring about the cancellation of the debt that we desperately need to even be able to remain standing. Because we're not talking about a recovery at this point. It's about removing the loads that are crushing us. How can we win our national and popular sovereignty? There is only one way, to overthrow the current regime of colonial occupation through a general insurrection based on the patriotic unity of the Greek people. There is no other way. We are left with no other choice. We all know it. We tried everything. Protests, strikes, shouting marches, whatever. So what? All we got was police beatings, brutal chemical warfare, and on top of it, occupation militias, essentially of mercenaries or Praetorian guards. They haven't gotten to raping yet, but who knows, it's early yet. They have left us no other option. And as Harilaos Trikupis said in 1876, the people are never to blame for their revolutions. Governments always bear that responsibility for making revolution inescapable. What about this revolution ahead of us? Let's clarify the term, because to some who are influenced by propaganda or by all the reactionary talking points all over the internet, the word revolution means blood, mayhem, chaos. No. A revolution is the people's own capacity on the grassroots level to make law, despite and against the structures of law forced upon them previously. This is a revolution. On this land, we attempted it 17 times after the ousting of Otto of Bavaria in 1862. 17 times, these people, and this revolution is not only inescapable, but it must be crowned by a people's national convention empowered to redraft the constitution. In other words, the possibility of a new constitution. Without it, the people cannot turn the creditors away. This business is under new management. Lenders are to address their complaints to the old management. They will find them in jail, where they belong. This is the purpose of EPAM. For this purpose, it organizes and prepares the popular energies. This general popular uprising is already in the making deep inside society. The people no longer wish to be governed the way they have been governed. And those who govern, even today, cannot do so except through fear and terrorism. This is an explosive recipe in and of itself. And as history teaches, it constitutes the prelude before every great social revolution. Welcome to pre-revolutionary Greece. The unified people's front has taken upon itself the duty to carry through this historic mission of the Greek people in the best most efficient and least damaging way. Dear comrades, friends, dear guests, we heard with great pleasure the proposal that was tabled for an international movement's organization on the basis of the common philosophy and the common positions that we appear to share. We are in total agreement. We listened with great attention to the various approaches and discussed various ways to build this international organization. EPAM wishes to state that it would welcome the creation of an international organization of genuinely popular movements that can contribute directly and practically to the struggle of each nation separately for its own national and social liberation. For this to happen, and for there to be a strong foundation of sincere and solidary relations between movements and activists who would like to participate in this journey henceforth, we propose a step-by-step -step approach. Let us begin initially with the establishment of an international network of movements and citizens 
with the purpose of coordinating information sharing and action. Let us first gain some experience in the ways that we can communicate but also assist each other's actions in practice in mutual support. In our opinion, in order for this international network to be truly international, it should not limit itself to European or European Union countries, but should also embrace as many movements as possible from countries inside and outside Europe. We are fully aware that on the international front, the European Union, Eurozone, Euro is a monstrosity, a Leviathan, to use the Hobbesian term, that threatens nations worldwide. The ultimate purpose of this international network ought to be the creation of a global movement against market oligarchy and against the globalization of capital and the supranational mechanisms for the dissolution of nations and the subalternization of peoples. The starting point of this international network should, in our opinion, be the triad national independence, popular sovereignty and social liberation, freedom, equality, brotherhood for all peoples and all countries without exceptions, the rights of the individual as a working person and as a citizen with self-determination first and foremost by the right to employment and to personal and collective dignity should be upheld by all with no preconditions. In this international network everyone can participate. Anyone who wants to fight against the supremacy of capital and supranational entities from the vantage point of freedom, national sovereignty and the democratic rebirth of the people of Europe and the world. Every movement, formation or individual activist requesting to participate and joining the network will preserve fully their autonomy of action and thought. There will be no centralized ideological control. Every movement, formation, individual activist wishing to participate will preserve their freedom of thought and action, will participate on an equal footing with others in the common effort and should contribute directly and in concrete ways in building fraternal relationships between movements and activists from all countries. EPAM promises to contribute with all its strength to the success of this international network and as a first step it envisions the creation of an information and communication gateway for all movements, activists and political formations interested in participating in or learning about the common struggle. This gateway can begin to operate right away based on a network of correspondence in each country, for example, who can provide news, information and analysis on the conditions and of populations and their countries. This is particularly useful to all of us given the iron curtain that has been imposed on information from the systemic media. Furthermore, EPAM considers it to be of utmost necessity to organize together visits by movement representatives wherever deemed necessary in consent in order to support individual country movements in their activism and organization efforts among their citizens. In this way, we can help each other to broaden the relevance and absorb the practical experience that exists around ways to organize and act in each country. We in Greece find this necessary and we commit ourselves to organize as soon as possible a tour of speakers and mass events around Greece with representatives of movements from other countries especially from countries that face similar situations to ours. We also commit ourselves to assist in organizing equivalent actions in other countries wherever we are invited. Our goal is to demonstrate that no people, no movement for national and social liberation should be alone against the supranational moloch of the global capitalist empire. We are all in this together 
and fighting for a new people's spring in Europe and in the world. Let the struggle of our people against the supranational totalitarianism of the Euro and the EU be the cradle of the rebirth of the most fundamental vindications of democracy, for national and popular sovereignty, where each people has the inalienable right to be the master in its country. Only a people free and sovereign in their homeland can recognize the exact same right for all others. Besides, this is the true meaning of internationalism, as articulated in practice in the struggle of generations of people, social and workers' movements against tyranny, absolutism, imperialism, colonialism, fascism and Nazism for two centuries now. And in the words, if I may, of an old partisan song, when our people united were fighting the Nazi conqueror and aspired to a free people ruled Greece. We want freedom for the homeland and for all humankind. Thank you very much.